Hi, I'm Brad Graver, Vice President of Secure World, and I want to welcome you to our midday keynote. So a couple of quick comments before we get started. Let me tell you, it's been an interesting exercise to, uh, to pivot from our in-person conference model to this 100% virtual experience. And uh, I must say, we couldn't have done it without our advisory councils and the support of our sponsor community as well. So thanks for being a part of this. And, uh, and uh, as I keep telling people, either on the phone or on these Zoom conferences, uh, we certainly hope uh, to be back in person at, at some point as well. Um, one positive from all this is how we've been able to extend our regional reach. So today, if you haven't noticed already, we have presenters and, uh, and representation from New York City and the Philadelphia security communities. So make sure you pop in on the exhibit floor in the networking lounge to, uh, to network with some companies that are based um, in both of those uh, geographic locations. So enough about us. Uh, I, I want to introduce you to Mike Lopez, who is the Director of Cloud Services at Access IT, and uh, just a fantastic partner with Secure World through the through the years. And uh, and Mike is so committed to the cloud that he literally wears it on his sleeve, uh, a, as you can see. So um, with that, Mike, I will pass the virtual baton over to yourself, and uh, look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate it. Uh, it's a great intro there. Um, for everybody that's joining us today, thank you. Um, you know, we've heard some great information already today from the other presenters. Of course, there's more to come as the day goes on. Um, as Brad said, it's definitely different doing this virtually, but I'm glad to see you all online. I'll be taking questions and answers as we go. So if you have something, feel free to drop it in the question and answer box, and I'll try to answer as many of them as I can. So before we talk about the courtship of the cloud, let's make sure we all agree on what the cloud entails, at least for purposes of this discussion. Cloud is a big word, and it means a lot of things to different people. If you ask five people what they define as cloud, most likely you'll get five different answers. I see this not only with business leaders, but even technical people. Depending on your experience, you may lean towards what is considered IaaS, SaaS, or even PaaS. In our organization, we use all three, and we have to evaluate the benefits and risks with each. Luckily, cloud has become more of a commonplace and the standard answer isn't, quote, it's just someone else's computer, end quote, anymore. As I see it, cloud continues to become an even bigger word the more organizations start to understand how they can consume applications that don't live in their own data center. Occasionally, I'll hear from leadership, we don't use cloud. We don't need to be concerned about the security or the development in it. Within a few questions, I typically find that they're using at least one of the three types, often multiple SaaS applications. It's become too easy to purchase a ready-built subscription-based application that you don't have to allocate room for in your data center or to not be using some sort of cloud-based service these days. These SaaS applications are built out already, and while they may need some customizing, they can be turned on and consumed very quickly with very little development time and consuming of resources. Simply sign an agreement, pull out the company credit card, and you're up and running. And many of those even have free trial access or versions and can solve a problem quickly. At the onset of this remote workforce, we realized that we needed to have a better instant messaging than our included Gchat. We had a Slack account by the end of the day, and we were up and running. There's no way we could have developed an application for that, and really no need. There are too many off the shelf, ready to consume applications out there. Why try to reinvent the wheel? Now, this isn't true for applications you may be building for your customers or internal use. This is where we start to evaluate IaaS for rapid deployment without the constraints of a data center. Anyone with a credit card can launch an AWS, Azure, or GCP deployment. Several years back, I would often hear about a development team that had deployed an application into a public cloud, only for security to find out later, usually when that code was to be promoted into production. This doesn't happen anywhere near as often anymore, luckily for security teams, but we all still have to be vigilant about shadow IT. For our courtship discussion, I'm referring to the IaaS public cloud providers like AWS, Azure, GCP, among others. These are easy to just dive right into, and while they offer some amazing opportunities, it takes time to get to know them and realize how best to leverage them. They are great, powerful tools, 
but with great power comes great responsibility. Trust but verify, right? Fortunately, there are tons of online resources to learn from, but I caution you, even the provider's how-to development guides tend to ignore security concerns. So we'll talk about the relationship with cloud and how it takes two to tango and why organizational communication is vital in this relationship. What we don't really address is the SaaS applications available, O365, G Suite, Salesforce, Slack, and others like that. And just because I don't talk about them specifically today doesn't mean they can be ignored, but securing those requires a different approach than to IaaS consumption models and even different tools. Like I said before, it's so easy to bring them into the enterprise. I'm sure you have some. And many of those host very sensitive data, like the CRM that manages your entire customer database, or the HR application that has every employee record and PII data. There are great tools to decide how these applications can be accessed, and what type of data can be moved into them and how, even with DLP protections. But that's a discussion for another time. I've been very fortunate to have been working with cloud models for what seems like forever despite the fact that it only, it's only close to a decade. I guess that's part of my relationship with the cloud. It started fast and here approaching 10 years later, it seems like it was yesterday. You married people out there know what I mean, right? Cloud moves so fast, I find myself stuttering and stammering when someone new to technology asks where they should start to learn about cloud. I have a hard time telling them where to start because I was lucky. I've watched it evolve since the beginning. There wasn't an Azure marketplace with pre-configured machines when I started in Azure. AWS offered their flavor of Linux, but that was about it. Everything really had to be built from the ground up, converting servers from virtualized on-premise servers to what would become your cloud image. I was able to learn the new features as they were released. Now features are coming out so fast it takes multiple teams. Cloud is definitely different today than what it was six to 12 months ago, and really almost a complete change since I started my journey. I've been quoted before saying, if you haven't visited the cloud in three months, go back, it's significantly different. That has held true since I started training people on cloud and is still true today. I can hardly keep up with our three partner changes these days. I bet I get no less than one email per day from our partner networks on the big three, but I make it a point to keep up because I truly believe in the cloud consumption model and love the flexibility that it brings to all aspects of IT. Even the dress code, right? I like to equate technical conversations to real life in a way that anyone at any technical level can relate to in their mind. I find people understand better when they can relate it to a personal experience. So as a follow-up to my last speaking engagement where I touched on the need for commitment to cloud, I wanted to expand on how that relationship evolves. So let's talk about the cloud courtship and how it's very much like dating. It is almost a necessity these days, much like dating is if you are single or was if you're already in a committed relationship. Like I said before, it's hard to find an organization that isn't using cloud in some way. Much like interpersonal relationships, there is excitement and dangers at each phase. And if you rush into something too quickly, it's more than likely going to expose a weakness somewhere at some point. We've all rushed into something before, only to realize maybe we skipped a step or missed something in our haste to move forward. In the cloud relationship, this can be a very expensive lesson, be it in capital expenditure or even worse, a security incident. So in an effort to help everyone understand where they are at with the cloud, I break it down into phases, just like with relationships. The five phases that I like to compare the cloud journey to are talking, dating, relationship, cohabitation, and marriage. I'm gonna compare how these phases equate to dating stages as the business seeks out what their cloud presence might be. Each phase has its own challenges and a way to overcome them with the help of better communication, education, and investments in time and tools. So phase one. Phase one I equate to the talking phase. Some teams are talking about how the cloud might be beneficial for the organization. C-level conversations might be had, and some demos are set up on a trial basis to see and learn. Think of it as a coffee date. You'll listen a bit and talk a bit, but unless there's a real interest or a motivating factor, it tends to be the initial, are we gonna try this or not type conversations. 
Typically at this point, very few people inside the organization are aware of the full capabilities of cloud operations, and security teams generally haven't been consulted yet. This phase tends to take several attempts in order to gain traction and support throughout the organization, and is often repeated depending on motivating factors and level of interest. Sometimes just a shiny new object is enough to garner attention from technologists. We all like to try new things and get a new toy. Different vendors will weigh in on their capabilities in the cloud, and the providers will come calling with demos for different teams. Generally at this point, there's minimal investment in the cloud technologies and budgets are not in place. A significant risk is that education for technologists is left up to the technical person to learn what they can specific to the actual task at hand in a broad overview. With any relationship just rooted in haphazard conversation or talking, you'll need a much more concrete commitment from both parties in order to establish a cloud presence. So phase two is much more like dating. You know, after a few attempts to get traction in the talking phase, some motivating factor has spearheaded more intrigued with what the cloud brings, and it's time to really start to dive in. At this point, a few non-critical applications might have been moved off to the cloud, and most likely in a lift and shift methodology. This phase is the getting to know you phase. There's no full commitment to development in the cloud. Cloud native services generally aren't being used, and developers are being asked to understand new cloud functions with little or no experience. At this point, sometimes security has become aware and even insistent on some sort of protocols, but not quite the full on-premise security stack. And generally, security lacks visibility in the cloud, and it becomes a growing concern for the future. There may be a small investment in cloud consumption, and vendors are providing some learning sessions specific to how they fit into the development and operational model of the business. Typically, there is little or no automation at this point either. Cloud spend certainly can spiral out of control quickly because optimization hasn't even been addressed. This can also be a very precarious situation for the security team as developers tend to be responsible for securing their applications with NSGs or ACLs without an in-depth knowledge of security protocols required for compliance. Most often, this is also the time where overprivileged over accounts are being used. Role-based access controls are much more wide open, encryption is not as focused, and cloud storage might even be left open to public access. As the relationship with the cloud grows, there is more of a commitment to making the cloud a priority. That moves us on into phase three, which is more like a committed relationship. This is the phase where there is some commitment to cloud, but still a wider separation from the traditional on-premise teams. Some applications reside in the cloud, some are still on-premise, typically determined by the ease of migration and which apps might have had budget to be refactored into a cloud application, or newly developed applications are developed to live in the cloud. At this point, more cloud native tools are used Oftentimes, outside consultants or experienced full-time employees are brought in to bolster the digital transformation and accelerate the curve. Security teams are now heavily involved trying to get visibility, understanding the nuances of cloud, and trying to figure out how to map on-premise controls and policies to the cloud environment that's just not quite the same as your traditional on-premise security stacks. Often, this becomes a major hurdle for security teams because the traditional approach to perimeter security doesn't work the same in cloud as there is no true perimeter. This is where the security teams typically begin their learning as to the best way to secure the organization's cloud environment. Where cloud creates a major change in the security focus is IAM and RBAC, where traditionally AD and firewall rules would rule in the on-premise world this changes in cloud with assumed roles, app registrations, and what level of access each contributor has to the components. Because these controls are specific to the cloud and the security team is usually playing catch up from the dating phase, learning all as fast as they can, this can be dangerous. So as the organization's security team plays catch up, they're constantly hunting for open or overly permissive access, trying to understand what has already been done. Because of this, most of the time, this is when a, the security team starts to evaluate tools to help them understand benchmarks, see where and how they can be more effective in securing the environment. Because of the separation, 
Security teams lack visibility. I constantly hear this from customer security teams. This is what drives the need for a tool that is based on cloud security and why we're seeing so many vendors develop cloud security posture management tools. Although this is a more defined relationship, there's still room for improvement. So phase four is more like cohabitating or living together. Certain adjustments have had to be made, we all know that, but there is a commitment to making this transformation work, merging existing resources and new ones. This is the part where the on-premise environment is significantly integrated with the cloud environment. This is a deep commitment to cloud, where cloud applications require on-premise access, whether it be in a load balance scenario or is database dependent because the database is still housed on-prem. Or the organization has developed a cloud first mentality, but legacy applications are managed and maintained by the on-premise team still. Cloud developers are leading application integration with cloud native services and even are starting to use serverless technologies and containers. Outside development teams are often being used. In-house cloud development teams are significantly more agile and taking advantage of the new features released by the providers. Security is now much more integrated into the cloud with controls both on-premise and in the cloud. Security has begun to get controls around IAM or RBAC and either integrating AD into the cloud or even using an SSO identity provider. Often, you'll see that the cloud security stack starts to mimic the on-premise architecture using vendor solutions for firewalls, load balancing, WAF, et cetera. While this works in traditional IaaS deployments, security is now playing catch up on the serverless and container technologies, trying to understand how these rapidly changing technologies can be secured. Tools that can see and understand how the containers are communicating or how a Lambda function might be affected are needed to help security understand the flow of traffic to best secure the environment, especially now that the on-premise environment could be exposed in a breach with overprivileged roles. Scale becomes a challenge because unless security has prepared for a true consumption model, traditional firewall rules need to be constantly updated. This is where the development team is using more and more automation and the security team has to look at dynamic adaptive security controls for the growing cloud environment, or they become a blocker to the agile methodology adopted by the development teams. Shift left becomes much more common in order to secure the application as it progresses from dev to prod. One of the biggest risks I find here is the lack of education to both the security and application teams. Developers need to be better educated on functions and privileged accounts. Security teams need to be educated as to benchmarks, compliance requirements, and have a roadmap for developers to be able to follow and stay in compliance, all the while taking advantage of the constant change the cloud brings us. This relationship is stronger than the previous three, but still has growing pains. There needs to be a commitment to working together as an organization to achieve full cloud adoption. So phase five I see is a marriage between the organization and the cloud. At this point, the organization has agreed on a budget, money has been allocated to the appropriate resources, and plans are ready to be executed. To me, this is a full commitment to the cloud. The organization has to be all in and committed from the C-level all the way down to the help desk. This happens for several reasons, whether it be because the OpEx model just makes more sense or because what I hear often is we just don't want to be in the data center business anymore. Other major factors are the requirement for on-demand scaling, geolocated services, and big data. With big data, there's no reason not to be in the cloud. In this marriage, developers have guidelines, or what I call guardrails, that security and compliance have set in advance. Seeing what makes the most sense for the organization but also allows adaptation of new cloud concepts as the providers roll them out. At this point, security teams have integrated controls that allow for visibility. They are confident in the IMR back control. MFA is even in place. Logs are being correlated and security teams know how to gather actionable intelligence. Typically applications have been refactored. Significant investment has been made in both the development but also an education for the teams. 
In this marriage, development teams are now using new tools that can validate code within hours instead of weeks. They've invested on getting certifications and instructor-led training. This investment in education leads to the use of more native cloud services, finding value in enterprise subscriptions with confidence that not only will the services perform well, but that the appropriate security has been applied. In this marriage, a constant stream of communication is required, staying agile while staying secure. Even though cloud usage is up, spend is now under control and budgets can be derived and allocated. Like any marriage, if you rushed into it and skipped a few of the steps, you're likely to find those same glaring holes, but now it's a huge risk because your organization is in the cloud. At this point, the cloud is not as scary as before, but it certainly can be vulnerable if the right security precautions aren't in place. Changing cloud is constant. This requires organizations to continue to adapt and continue to invest in their growing relationship. I find that customers that have rushed into a cloud marriage often find themselves falling behind in both development and security and end up taking shortcuts that could create enormous risk for the organization. Yes, it is going to cost more to get to the cloud in a planned, organized, invested fashion. But in the end, you'll have an organizational wide change with complete buy-in, understanding of the technology, and most important to us, how to mitigate the risk. I believe that the most important part of this marriage is the planning phase. In my opinion, 80% of the success of the cloud relationship relies on getting all parties involved in the planning to create effective communication across the organization as this technology is constantly evolving. So what does your cloud commitment look like? Like with any relationship, there can be challenges throughout the journey. Teams each have their own motivating factors and often leaders have to broker compromise. Security has to weigh the risk against the benefits and leadership has to determine what the risk appetite is going to be for the organization as they press on with their cloud relationship. As you evaluate your organizational relationship with the cloud, you might wanna think about which phase you are currently in and how you can improve and move your organization forward to a better relationship with the cloud, as well as building in security to your overall plan. Depending on what phase of your journey you're in, there are resources available to help you at every step. Access IT Group can help guide you to the next step. We can springboard your internal team's knowledge and discussions. So the million dollar question is, where are you at with your relationship with the cloud? Access IT Group can give you a comprehensive assessment of your current state against best practices, CIS benchmarks, or even industry specific compliance standards with the use of our automated tools and human intelligence and provide your report on how well your environment measures up. And for Secure World attendees, we're running a special cloud security promotion. Be sure to visit our booth for more details. Hey, Mike, uh, thank you for that. And, uh, and I'm sure you've seen, um, as, your, as your last few comments uh, recognized, you've seen commitments from uh, every side of the spectrum, all the way in between, and and uh, and can can talk intelligently about everybody's step in that journey as people come by your booth. Correct? Yeah, I'm glad to have you come by. Awesome, and I appreciate the offer to Secure World attendees as well. So definitely take advantage of that, and uh, appreciate your insight and expertise on this ever-changing topic that I'm sure. Um, is in the process of, with everything we're doing right now digitally, will continue to change as we see more innovation coming forward. So appreciate everything okay. again. And thanks again to Access IT for the great partnership. And uh, on, uh, we have a full uh, uh, schedule of, of sessions still to come, but we do have a few minutes for you to uh, visit the Exhibitor Hall and Access IT's booth. So. At that point, I will sign off and see everybody at the end of the day. Thank you again. Thanks, everybody.